A Warhammer Novel, Orcs Lair, Godric and Felix, Volume 8, written by Nathan Long. This is a dark age, a bloody age, an age of demons and of sorcery. It is an age of battle and death, and of the world's ending. Amidst all the fire, flame and fury, it is a time, too, of mighty heroes, of bold deeds, and of great courage. At the heart of the old world sprawls the Empire, the largest and most powerful of the human realms. Known for its engineers, sorcerers, traders and soldiers, it is a land of great mountains, mighty rivers, dark forests, and vast cities. And from his throne in Aldor reigns the Emperor Karl Franz, sacred descendant of the founder of these lands, Sigmar, and wielder of his magical warhammer. But these are far from civilized times. Across the length and breadth of the old world, from the knightly palaces of Bretonia to ice-bound Kislev in the far north, come the rumblings of war. In the towering World's Edge mountains, the orc tribes are gathering for another assault. Bandits and renegades harry the wild southern lands of the border princes. There are rumors of rat things, the skaven, emerging from the sewers and swamps across the land. And from the northern wildernesses, there is the ever-present threat of chaos, of demons and beastmen corrupted by the foul powers of the dark gods. As the time of battle draws ever near, the Empire needs heroes like never before. At long last, we were sailing home. After nearly two decades following the Slayer as he chased his doom east and south and east again, through Araby, Ind, and Cathay, I was returning with him to the old world and the lands of our birth. Years had I longed for this day, but when it came, it was not to bring either of us the joy or peace we hoped it would. Instead, we found terror and strife waiting for us at the moment our feet touched land. My companion met an old friend, and was asked to honor an old oath, little knowing what horror or bloodshed would come out of these things. Before the nightmare came to its bitter, bloody end, I saw the Slayer happier than I had ever known him to be, but also more miserable. It was a strange time, and it is with great reluctance that I stirred those sad memories in order to record them here. From My Travels with Godric, Volume 7 by Herr Felix Jäger, Aldorf Press, 2527. Chapter 1 Orcs? Godric shrugged. I fought enough orcs. Felix peered at the slayer in the gloom of the merchant ship's crammed forward cabin. The thick-muscled dwarf sat on a bench, his flame-bearded chin sunk to his chest, an immense stein of ale in one massive fist, and a broached half-keg at his side. The only illumination came from a small porthole, a rippling, seasick green reflection from the waves outside. But they blocked Barak Var, said Felix. We won't be able to dock. You want to get to Barak Var, don't you? You want to walk on dry land again? Felix wanted to dock, that was for sure. Two months in this seagoing coffin, where even the dwarf had to duck his head below decks, had driven him crazy. I don't know what I want, rumbled Godric, except another drink. He took another drink. Felix scowled. Fair enough. If I live, I will write in this grand poem of your death that you drowned heroically below decks, drunk as a halfling on harvest day while your comrades fought and died above you. Godric slowly raised his head and fixed Felix with his one glittering eye. After a long moment where Felix thought the slayer might leap across the cabin and rip his throat out with bare hands, Godric grunted. You got away with words, man Lang. He put down the stein and picked up the axe. Barakvar was a dwarven port built inside a towering cliff at the easternmost end of the Black Gulf. A curving talon of water that cut deeply into the lawless badlands 
south of the Black Mountains and the Empire. Both the harbor and the city were tucked into a cave so high that even the tallest warship could sail under its roof and dock at its teeming wharves. The entrance was flanked by 50-foot statues of dwarven warriors standing in massive stone ship rows. A squat sturdy lighthouse sat at the end of a stone spit to their right, the flame of which, it was said, could be seen for 20 leagues around. Felix could see almost none of this architectural wonder, though, for a boat-borne horde of orcs floated between him and Barakvar's wide shadowed entrance and a thicket of patched sails, masts, crude banners and strung-up corpses blocked his view. The line looked impenetrable, a floating barricade of captured and lashed together warships, merchantmen, rafts, barges and galleys that stretched for almost a mile in a curving arc before the port. Smoke from cooking fires rose above many of the decks, and the water around them bobbed with floating corpses and floating garbage. Do you see? said Captain Doucette, an extravagantly mustachioed Bretonian trader from whom Godric and Felix had caught a ride in Tylea. It looks like they build from every prize and worship that tries to pass, and I must land. I have to sell a hold full of in spices here, and pick up dwarven steel for Bretonia. If no, the ship will make a loss. Is there some place you can break through? asked Felix. His long blonde hair and his red Sutherland wool cloak whipping about in the blustery summer wind. Will the ship take it? Oh, we, oui, said Doucette. She is strong, the Rain Celeste. We fight off many pirates, smash little boats in the way. Trading is no easy life, eh? But orcs? Don't you worry about the orcs, said Gotrek. Doucette turned and looked at Gotrek, from bristling crimson crest to leathery eye patch to sturdy boots and back again. Forgive me, my friend. I do not doubt that you are very formidable. The arms like trunks of trees, yes? The chest like the bull. But you are only one man, eh, dwarf? One slayer, growled Gotrek. Now fill your sails and get on. I got a keg to finish. Doucette cast a pleading eye at Felix. Felix shrugged. I did follow him through worse than this. Captain! A lookout called from the crow's nest. More ships behind us! Doucette, Gotrek and Felix turned and looked over the stern rail. Two small cutters and a Tylean warship were angling out of a small cove and racing towards them their sails fat with wind. All the fancy woodwork had been stripped away from them, replaced with rams, catapults and trebuchets. The head of the beautiful, bare-breasted figurehead on the warship's prow had been replaced by a troll's skull, and rotting corpses dangled by their necks from the bowsprit. Orcs stood along the rail, bellowing guttural war cries. Goblins capered and screeched all around them. Doucette hissed through his teeth. They make the trap, no? Pinch like the crayfish. Now we have no choice. He turned and scanned the floating barrier, and then pointed, shouting to the pilot. Two points starboard, look! At the rafts! Ferruzzi, clap on the sail! Felix followed Doucette's gaze as the steersman turned the wheel and the mate sent the wasters up the shrouds to unfurl more canvas. Four ramshackle rafts, piled with looted barrels and crates, were lashed loosely together between a battered Empire man o' war and a half charred Estalian galley. Both the ships were alive with orcs and goblins, hooting and waving weapons at Duchette's trader. The merchantman's sails cracked like pistols as they filled with wind, and it picked up speed. Battle stations, called Duchette. Prepare to receive borders. Where the grapnels? Greenskins, large and small, were pouring over the sides of the man o' war and the galley, and running across the rafts towards the point where the merchantmen meant to break through. True to the captain's warning, half of them swung hooks and grapnels above their heads. Felix looked back. The cutters and the warship were gaining. 
if the merchantmen made it through the blockade, it might outrun the pursuers. But if they were caught... By the lady, no, said Dusset suddenly. Felix turned. All along the raft-bound man-o'-war, black cannon muzzles were pushing out of square-cut ports. We will be blown to pieces, said Dusset. But, but they're orcs, said Felix. An orc can't aim to save his life. Dusset shrugged. At such a range, do they really need to aim? Felix looked around desperate. Well, can you blow them up? Shoot them before they shoot you? You joke, mon ami, laughed Dusset. He pointed to the few catapults that were the merchantman's only artillery. These will do little against Empire Oak. They were rapidly approaching the blockade. It was too late to attempt to turn aside now. Felix could smell the greenskins, a filthy animal smell, mixed with the stink of garbage, offal, and death. They could see the earrings glinted in their tattered ears and make out the crude insignia painted on their shields and ragged armor. You will throw me at it, said Gotrek. Felix and Dusset looked at him. The dwarf had a mad gleam in his eye. What? asked Dusset. Throw you? Put me in one of your rock lobbers and cut the cord. I'll deal with this floating filth. You, you want me to catapult you? asked Dusset, incredulous. Like the bomb? The grub I do it. Anything a goblin can do, a dwarf can do better. But, Godric, you might, said Felix. Godric raised an eyebrow. What? Uh, never mind. Felix had been about to say that Godric might get himself killed, but that was, after all, the point, wasn't it? Godric crossed to one of the catapults and climbed into the bucket. He looked like a particularly ugly bulldog sitting up a serving ladle. Just make sure to put me over the rail, not into the side. We will try, Master Dwarf, said the chief of the catapult crew. Uh, you will not kill us if you die. I will kill you if you don't start shooting, growled Godric. Fire! We oui, we. Oui. The crew angled the gun around, huffing at the extra weight of Godric until it faced the man of war and then crank the firing arm a little tighter. Hold on to your axe, Master Dwarf, said the crew chief. Perhaps a helmet, or, said Felix, but the chief crew dropped his hand. Fire! A crewman pulled a lever, and the catapult's arm shot up and out. Godric flew through the air in a long high arc, straight for the man of war, bellowing a bull-throated battle cry. Felix stared blankly as Godric flattened against the patch canvas of the Man of War's war sail and slid down to the deck in a seething swarm of orcs. The real question, he said to no one in particular, is how I'm gonna make all of this rhyme. He and the catapult's crew craned their necks, trying to find Godric in all the chaos, but all they could see was a swirl of hulking green bodies and the rise and fall of enormous black iron cleavers. At least they're not stopping, Felix thought. If they were still fighting, then Godric was alive. And then the orcs stopped fighting, and instead began running to and fro. Is he? asked Dusset. I don't know, said Felix, biting his lip. After all the dragons, the demons, and the trolls Godric had fought, would he really die facing mere orcs? The lookout's voice boomed down from above. Impact incoming! With a jarring crunch, the merchantman crashed into the line of rafts, smashing timber, snapping cord, and sending barrels and crates and over-enthusiastic orcs flying into the cold, choppy water. The side of the man o' war rose like a castle directly to their right, her cannon ports level with Dusset's deck. Grapnels whistled through the air to the left and right and Felix ducked just in time to miss getting hooked through the shoulder. They bit into the rail and the deck and the sails, their ropes thrumming tight as the ship continued forwards. 
The crew of the Rain Celeste chopped at them with hatchets and cutlasses, but two more caught for each one they cut. A thunderous boom went off in Felix's right ear, and one of the Man o' War cannon, not fifteen feet away, was obscured in white smoke. A cannonball whooshed by at head level and parted a rat line. Felix swallowed. It looked like Godric had failed. Bordes! Bordes! came Doucette's voice. The merchant ship had broken through the orc line and was inside the blockade, but was slowing down sharply, towing the grapnel-hooked rafts and the rest of the ships with it. The man-o'-war was turning as it was pulled, and its guns remained trained on Doucette's vessel as waves of roaring green monsters climbed up the lines and the sides and clambered over the rail. Felix drew the dragon-hilted sword and joined the others as they raced to hold them off. Men of every color and land stabbing, hacking, and shooting at the age-old enemies of humanity. Tyleans in stocking caps and baggy trousers, Bretonians in strip pantaloons, men of Araby, Ind, and further places, all fighting with the crazy desperation of fear. There was no retreat, and surrender meant an orc stewpot. Felix sideswiped a cleaver blow that would have cut him in half had it connected, and then ran his opponent through the neck. Two goblins attacked him from the flanks. He killed one and kicked the other. Another orc surged up in front of him. Felix was no longer the willowy young poet he had used to be, when, during a night of drunken camaraderie, he had pledged to record Gotrek's doom in an epic poem. Decades of fighting at the Slayer's side had hardened him and filled him out, and made the seasoned swordsman out of him. Even so, he was no match, physically at least, for a seven-foot monster of a greenskin. The beast was more than twice his weight, with arms thicker than Felix's legs, and an underslung jaw from which were jutting cracked tusks. It stank like the back end of a pigsty. Its mad red eyes blazed with fury as it roared and swung a black iron cleaver. Felix ducked and slashed back, but the orc was quick and knocked the sword aside. There was another boom and a cannonball punched into the rail ten feet to Felix's left, cutting a swath through the melee that killed merchants and orcs alike. Red blood and black blood mixed on the slippery deck. Felix deflected a swipe from the orc that shivered his arm to the shoulder. The catapult's crew chief fell back in two pieces beside him. Another series of booms rocked the ship, and Felix thought that the orcs had somehow gotten off a disciplined salvo. He glanced past the orc to the man o' war. Smoke was pouring from the cannon ports, but strangely, no cannonball. The orc slashed at him. Felix hopped back and tripped over the crew chief's torso. He landed flat on the side in a puddle of blood. The orc guffered and raised the cleaver over his head. With a massive carump, the man o' war exploded into a billowing wall of flame, bits of timber and rope and orc parts spinning past. The fighters on the deck of the merchantmen were blown off their feet by a hammer of air. Felix felt as if his eardrums had been stabbed with pikes. The orc above him staggered and looked back at his chest, surprised. A cannon's cleaning rod was sticking out between his ribs, the bristly head dripping with gore. The creature toppled forwards. Felix rolled out of the way and sprang to his feet, looking towards the flame-enveloped man of war So, Godric had done it after all. But at what cost? Surely there was no way the dwarf could have survived. Out of the boiling fireball toppled the man o' war's main mast, crashing towards the merchantman's deck like a felled tree, and racing out across it, half climbing, half running, was a broad, compact figure, face and skin as black as iron, red crest and beard smoldering and singed. The top of the mast crashed down through the merchantman rail and pulverized the knot of goblins that was climbing over. With a wild roar, Godric leapt out of the makeshift bridge into the merchantman's waist, right in the middle of the crowd of orcs which was pushing Doucette's crew towards the stern castle with heavy losses. The slayer spun as he landed, axe outstretched, 
and a dozen orcs and goblins went down at once, spines and legs and necks severed. Their companions turned to face him, and seven more went down. Heartened, the crew pressed onwards, attacking the confused orcs. Unfortunately, more were running across the rafts, and the merchantman was still caught in a net of grapnels and pinned in place by the fallen mast. Felix leapt the forecastle rail, yelling to Doucette as he plunged into the circle of orcs and goblins towards Gotrek. Cut the lines and clear the mast! Forget the orcs! Doucette hesitated and then nodded. He screamed at the crew in four languages and they fell back, chopping at the remaining ropes and heaving together to push the mast off their starboard rail, while the greenskins pressed in to take on the crazy slayer. Felix took up his accustomed position, behind and slightly to the left of Godrek, just far enough away to be clear of the sweep of the axe, but close enough to protect his back and flanks. The orcs were frightened, and showed it by trying desperately to kill the object of their fear. But the harder they tried, the faster they died, getting in each other's way in their eagerness, forgetting Felix until he had run them through their kidneys, fighting each other for the chance to kill Godrek. The deck under the dwarf's feet was slick with black blood, and orc and goblin bodies were piled higher than his chest. Godrek caught Felix's eye as he bifurcated an orc, top knot to groin. Not a bad little scrap, eh, man Lang? I thought you died at last, said Felix, ducking a cutlass. Godrek snorted as he gutted up another orc. Not likely. Stupid orcs all had the powder up on the gun deck. I cut some ugly greenskin's head off and stuck it in a cook fire until it caught. He barked a sharp laugh as he decapitated two goblins. And then bolted down the gun like like I was playing ninepins. That did it. With a screeching and snapping of rending timbers, the crew finally pushed the man of war's mast clear of the rail. Grapnel lines parted with twangs like a loosed bows as the rain celeste surged onwards, straightening out before the wind. The crew cheered and turned to fight the last few orcs. It was over in just a few seconds. Felix and the others wiped their blades and looked back just in time to see the other three orc pursuing ships smash together as they tried to shoot the gap through the blockade at once. Roars of fury rose from them and the crews began to hack at each other while their boats became inextricably fouled in the mess of rafts, ropes, and floating debris. Next to the three ship squabble, the remains of the man of war slowly sank into the gulf under a towering plume of black smoke. Orcs from further down the line were hastily cutting it free so it didn't pull anything else down with it. Captain Doucette steeped up to Gotrek and bowed low. He had a deep gash on his forearm. Master Dwarf, we owe you our lives. You have saved us and our cargo from certain destruction. Gotrek shrugged. Eh, it was only orcs. Nonetheless, we are extremely grateful. If there is anything we may do to repay you, you have only to name it. Huh, said Gotrek, stroking his still smoldering beard. You can get me another keg of beer. I nearly finished the one below. It was a tense twenty minutes. Sailing into the harbor from the blockade, the crew warily watching the rafts and rowboats of orcs that chased after them from the floating barricade until they at last gave up and fell behind. As the rain celeste got closer to Barakvar's cavernous opening, they had to pick their way through a litter of ragged vessels half sunk around the sea wall. Signals flew from the lighthouse, which Captain Doucette answered speedily. Grim-faced dwarf and cannon crews watched them from the fortified emplacements below it. Dwarf masons were at work on the lighthouse itself, repairing a great hole blasted in the side. Felix gazed in wonder as the rain celeste sailed between the two statues and into the shadow of the harbor cavern staggered by the beauty and proportions of the place. The cave was so wide and so deep, he couldn't even see the walls. Hundreds of thick chains hung down from the darkness of the roof. At the end of each one 
was an octagonal lantern the size of a carriage, which provided an even yellow light which allowed ships to find their way to the docks. The harbor filled the front half of the cave, a wide curving frontage, from which the branching stone fingers of keys and wharves extended. They were laid out with typical dwarfish precision, evenly spaced and perfectly positioned, to make maneuvering in and out of the slips as easy as possible for the ships that docked there. Even now, there were 30 vessels berthed, and there was enough room left for another 50 or more. A city of stone rose beyond the harbor. It was strange for Felix, who had visited more dwarf holds than many humans ever would, to see such human structures as houses and mercantile buildings arranged along broad avenues under the shadow-hidden roof of the cave. But the dwarves had made these surface world forms their own. Never had Felix seen squatter, more massively built houses, all steel-gray granite and decorated to the roof peaks with intricate geometric dwarf ornamentation. Even the smallest of them could have withstood a cannon blast. As they approached the embankment, a tiny dwarf steam vessel, little more than a dinghy with a furnace, puffed out to them, and then guided them to an empty slip. A cheer erupted from the dock as the crew threw their lines and extended a gangplank. There was a crew of almost a hundred people there to welcome Captain Doucette and his crew as they stepped off the ship. Most of them were dwarves, but there were many men as well. The harbor master, a fat dwarf in slashed doublet and breeches, stamped forward among the general hubbub of congratulation and greeting. Welcome, Captain and twice welcome. You are the first ship to dock here in three weeks, since the accursed orcs set their barricade. A great deed, sir. Doucette turned to Godrek. This one do the deed, sir. He blew up the man o' war with a single hand, right? Then we are indebted to you, Slayer, said the harbor master, bowing low. And then, without further ado, he took out his ledger and got to business. Now, sir, what do you carry? He licked his lips eagerly. I bring cinnamon and other spices from Ind, said Doucette grandly, and oil of palm, patterned rugs of Araby, and little lace caps for the ladies. Very pretty, yes? The harbor master's smile crumpled, and many of the crowd fell silent. Spices? All you have is spices. And rugs and caps. Ah, spices, grunted the harbor master. What good are spices when we have no meat? You can't make a meal of pepper and salt. Monsieur, I... The orcs have been blocking the harbor for three weeks now, interrupted Gotrek. What is ailing you? Why haven't you blasted them out of the water yet? A dwarven sailor with his beard and hair in tarred braids spoke up before the harbor master could reply. The grungny cursed greenskins got lucky and sank one of our ironclads, and the other is transporting Dowie to the war in the north. It is true, said the harbor master. We've so many gone to aid the empire, with barely enough dwarves and ships to keep the orcs from entering the harbor, let alone chasing them away. They infest the land entrance as well. We're besieged land and sea. Godric and Felix glanced at each other. War? asked Godric. What war? You don't know of the war? asked the harbor master. Where have you been? End and Araby, spat Godric, chasing our tails. You say that this war is in the Empire? asked Felix. Aye, said the sailor. The chaos hordes coming again south, usual madness. Some chosen one or another, and his lads making a try for the world. A lot of old sent dwarf north to help turn them back. Our ships carried many of them. Chaos, said Godric, his eye shining. Now there's a challenge. 
It were better if we left men's troubles to men, said the harbour master bitterly. The orcs have taken advantage of the clans being away, and are rising all over the badlands. Many small holds and human towns have been put to fire and sword. Even Karak Hirn is lost. The other holds have buttoned themselves up tight until they're up at full strength again. But how goes the war? asked Felix. Does the empire still stand? Have they reached Nuln? The harbor master shrugged. Who can say? The overland caravans stopped coming more than a month ago, and every ship that docked before the orcs strung their rafts across our mouth had a different story. One said Middenheim had fallen, another that Aldorf was in flames. The next one said that the hordes had been pushed back to the wastes and never got further than Prague. It might already be over for all we know. Grimnir make it so. These orcs must be put down, or we're gonna starve. Godric and Felix turned back to Captain Doucet. Take us out of here, said Godric. We must get north. Yes, said Felix. I have to get to Nuln. I must see if it still exists. Doucet blinked. But, but, my friends, it is impossible. We must make repairs, no? And I must take on water and supplies and cargo. It will be at least a week. He gestured to the entrance of the harbor, glowing orange in the late afternoon sun. And what of the green ones? Will we make the escape the way we made the entrance? It may not be easy, eh? Damn your excuses, said Gotrek. I got a doom waiting for me. Let's go. Doucette shrugged. My friend, I cannot. Not for a week. It is impossible. Gotrek glared at him, and Felix was afraid he was going to grab the captain by the scruff of the neck and drag him back on board. But finally the slayer cursed and turned away. Where's Malachi McKyson when you need him? He growled. Forgive me, harbor master, said Felix, bowing. But can you tell me where we can find lodgings for a week? The harbor master barked a laugh. Good luck with that. The city is filled to bursting with refugees from every hold and human town of the Badlands. There isn't a bed left to any price, and not much food either. But you got cinnamon to dine on, so you'll make out all right. Gotrek bowled his fists as the crowd laughed. For once, Felix was in a similar mood. He wanted to punch everyone in reach in the nose. This was maddening. He had to get north. He had to learn what had become of his family, his father, his brother Otto. He didn't want to stay in some out-of-the-way port while his home, his country, was ravaged by bloodthirsty barbarians. He had seen what the hordes had done to the lands of Kislev. That the same thing might be happening in the Empire, in the Reichland and the Averland, while he was away and powerless to stop it, was almost more than he could bear. Come on, man Leng, said Gotrek finally, turning towards the city and hefting the axe. Let's go make some empty beds. <laughs>